Hello, everybody, and welcome to this Politico event. Thank you for joining us online, and thanks to our partner, Bayer, for making this virtual event possible. Today's debate is all about pesticides, specifically the synthetic chemical substances, though not always, that farmers use to protect their crops from pests and diseases. I think we can all agree this is no longer merely a niche subject for chemists in white coats toiling away in remote laboratories. In fact, this technical yet crucial subject has leapt to the top of the political agenda in Europe in the last few years. We've seen huge amounts of citizen pressure calling for a ban on the weed killer glyphosate amid a debate about its potential to cause cancer. We've had mountains of court cases about pesticides the EU has decided to ban. A special year-long pesticides committee established in the European Parliament. And we've heard scientists warning about an impending insect apocalypse. All of this led the European Commission earlier this year to set an ambitious target on pesticides in the European Green Deal as part of the Farm to Fork strategy for agriculture to reduce the use and risks of pesticides by 50% by the end of the decade. But the debate about the final number in those targets and crucially how to make it all happen is still raging. So we have a lot to talk about and a lot to understand this evening. So let me just explain how it's going to work. Today's event will have two parts. First off, we'll start with an information gathering interview, um, which I'll conduct with two farmers, one who uses pesticides on his farm and one who doesn't use them on hers. And then we'll move on to our Oxford style debate, where our four speakers, including two members of the European Parliament, will be debating the following motion. Pesticides are not necessary for a resilient EU food system. We also want to hear what you think of the motion before the debate even starts. We will then ask you to vote again at the end so we can see how convincing our speakers have been. To cast your opening vote on the motion, go to slido.com from your computer or download the app on your phone and use the hashtag resilientfoodeu. Instructions should be coming up on the screen now if you're watching from our event page. Also, don't forget to bombard us with tweets using the same hashtag, ResilientFoodEU. I can see people have already started to, to vote, so that's great. Keep it up. Um, and also, you can ask questions, um, which I will then um, filter and put to the panelists um, using the same app. Um, great. So before we crack on with the debate, let me first introduce Bruno Tremblay, who is BioCrop Sciences Regional Head for Europe, the Middle East, and Africa, who has some welcoming remarks. Bruno. Yeah, good evening, everyone. Good evening, uh, Elie. Thank you for, for giving me the, the words of uh, introduction. So I'm, I'm Bruno Tremblay, the head of uh, Bayer Crop Science in, uh, in uh, Europe, uh, Africa, and Middle East. I'm pleased to welcome you to uh, what I hope is going to be a, an insightful re uh, discussion regarding the role of pesticide uh, for a resilient food uh, system. Uh, one of our most uh, basic needs, uh, a reliable food supply, is constantly threatened uh, by a series of external factors uh, like uh, weather, climate, uh, the general volatility of agricultural markets. Adding to this the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, the need for sustainable farming and a more resilient food, food system has never been uh, greater. As one of the leading input providers in agriculture, uh, we can help enable that enough healthy and affordable food is available across countries in Europe. And with that comes the responsibility to help ensure that we do so with the lowest environmental impact. In Bayer, sustainability drives our action daily as we try to live up to our Bayer vision, health for all, hunger for none. But no one can do it alone. It will take all of us. Stakeholders across the farm to fork value chain, farmers, regulators, policy makers, civil society, including industry, must come together to listen to each other, to hear mutual concern and reach a common understanding on how to advance the safety and reliability of our food supply. As input providers, we see ourselves as part of the solution, and that is why uh, today, we present this political Oxford-style debate to convene policymakers, influence 
sectors, media, to engage in a science-based debate on pesticide in a resilient food system. Having worked in agriculture for a long time, I continuously hear farmers tell me how they need more innovation in the areas of plant breeding or crop protection. Uh, they look at those in conjunction with precision and digital farming tools and want these tools to reach them more quickly. They tell us about the need to look at farming in a holistic way and how they expect the technologies to be safe, to use and sustainable to our environment. So while people may have differing opinions about the tools used in agriculture, I think we can all agree that achieving a resilient food system requires innovation. A smart mix of innovative technologies coupled with the science-based and innovation-friendly policies will help European agriculture achieve carbon neutrality and create the food system we need. Our common aim should be to responsibly evaluate these technologies objectively and consider both risk and benefit when making regulatory decisions. But reaching consensus on the use of pesticide and other innovative technology is a difficult and emotional undertaking. Although today it should be possible to reach some level of objectivity in the discussion, as our industry is becoming increasingly more transparent, uh, let me give you some example of those transparency initiatives that we took. Since 2017, Bayer has been putting our product safety studies online. By this, we aim to show the scientific rigor on our commitment when it comes to the safety of our products. And we have been raising the bar on transparency in the industry. So as part of our industry association uh, initiative, we launched in 2018 uh, the ECPA, Industry Data Transparency Initiative. Through that work, we make the safety data related to human health and the environment of our member companies available to the public. These days, the GRG Glyphosate Renewal Group is, as part of the EU regulatory reauthorization procedure, making the files of the scientific dossier available to the public through both uh, their own website and the EFSA website. In September this year, this year, the ECPA, or European Crop Protection Association, launched the Industry 2030 Commitments to contribute to the European Commission Green Deal ambition. Our industry is investing, is investing 14 billion euros uh, by 2030 globally uh, towards uh, digital farming and biopesticide innovation. European agriculture can play a leading role in moving the world toward a more sustainable and resilient food system, but only if we implement policies, practices that facilitate more agriculture, more agricultural innovation and not less. Uh, we believe pesticide and crop protection products, including biologicals, are part of the solution, but regarding pesticide regulation specifically, uh, the focus must be on environmental impact reduction over a simple volume reduction. In conclusion, I would like to say that to achieve the objective of the EU Green Deal that we support, uh, we must adopt regulatory policies that encourage innovation across the agricultural toolbox, including plant breeding, digital science, and crop protection. Farmers are the most critical stakeholders in the process and policies must support or must be supportive of their work. Therefore, I really hope that during tonight's debate, also topics like holistic approach to sustainable farming, transparency, innovation enabling policies, as well as science consideration, make it into the discussion. And with that, Eddie, over to you, and may the debate begin. Great. Thank you very much. OK. Now, let's move on quickly to our next um, part of the discussion. Joining us for our joint interview, let me introduce our two uh, farmers. 
we have Helen Browning, who is the chief executive of the British organics charity, the Soil Association. Um, Helen, why don't we just do like a little wave so, we, so everyone can, can see what, okay, fantastic. Um, and Helen is also a farmer in her own right. And we also have Olivier Gérard, um, a farmer producing crops such as sugar beet, uh, alfalfa and wheat in the northeast of France. Hello there, Olivier, give us a wave. Good evening, everyone. Okay, fantastic, we've got you. So, I really want to use our discussion now, which is about 10, 10 or 15 minutes, to, uh, to understand more about the realities of the choice between using or not using pesticides. So, let's kick off maybe with Helen. Um, why don't you describe to us your farm, um, where it is and what you grow? So I farm in Wiltshire in the south of England, um, about 1,500 acres. I'm a tenant farmer, so I don't own the land. I rent it from the church commissioners. Um, and I have a mixture of farming enterprises here. So we have dairy cattle, uh, beef, uh, pigs, and arable crops. So we grow wheat, uh, barley, oats, sometimes things like triticale or spelt. Um, and in the past, we've grown brassica crops, uh, carrots, potatoes, that kind of thing as well. But the majority of our cropping is arable crops, um, cereals. And uh, I'm also experimenting a lot with agroforestry, with tree crops. So looking at nuts, fruits, soft fruits, that kind of stuff as well. So it's a very mixed farm. Uh, we also run our, a, a pub on the farm and a hotel, and, and we sell our products into the multiple retailers. So wow. a very mixed enterprises. Great. And um, just let's just, you know, so we've got that in our minds. Let's go over to Olivier. Olivier, can you describe to us your farm? What, what do you grow? What is it like? Yeah, my, my system is very different uh, than uh, Ellen, but we are doing the, the same uh, <clears throat> The same job. Uh, uh, I'm only uh, on uh, arable crops with uh, wheat, barley, rapeseed, uh, of course, uh, sugar beets, uh, peas, and uh, little alfalfa. Okay. Okay, fantastic. So, you know, that, that, there's enough to feed us on both of your farms, probably enough to feed the panel, certainly. Um, let's talk about the ways you farm then. Um, because Helen Holland, obviously, as the, um, you know, as, as the CEO of the, of the British Organics Charity Soil Association, it would be a bit strange if you're using pesticides. So what do you do in order not to have to use pesticides and still produce enough yield, you know, and st still produce a healthy amount of, amount of food at the end of the year, or at the end of the season? So most organic systems are based on rotational farming. Um, so you're uh, building your soil fertility, your nitrogen fertility through fixing nitrogen uh, through leguminous crops like clovers. Um, and then uh, you're using that fertility to grow your arable crops. So we don't do the same thing in the same place for very long. That's one way of avoiding the pests and weeds and diseases. Um, and we're not oversupplying nitrogen to the system. So uh, you tend to have a more resilient uh, plant. Um, we obviously choose varieties too that have resistance to the diseases that we are likely to have. Uh, there's a lot of kind of what we would call cultural techniques. So, uh, you know, some of the things that we would make sure we do, like not leaving ground bare in August to avoid things like the wheat bulb fly. Um, you know, there's a lot of, of knowledge, I think, within an organic system, which we try and bring to bear to reduce the uh, incidence of pests and diseases. Um, I guess weeds are still the biggest challenge in most organic systems. Um, and again, it's, it's about good rotations. Uh, there are bits of kit you can use to weed these days that's getting more sophisticated, which is helpful. Uh, but the main thing is to have a soundly based rotation so that you're feeding the soil with your leguminous crops, with your animal manures, and then you're uh, taking that into the cropping cycle uh, to produce uh, healthy plants that will be resistant to disease and uh, hopefully not have too many weeds as well. But some weeds are good because they're great for biodiversity. That's what the insects live on. Okay. Uh, so we're not looking for a completely weed-free crop. Right, right. So we'll get on to the biodiversity aspect. Um, you know, I'm, I'm thinking of structuring our conversation in terms of you know, the practicalities, and then we can talk about human health and then the environment later on, as well as food security. So, but just to throw the question, so we've heard about, Helen, you know, what, what you do on your farm and how you, how you make it work, and there's some really interesting techniques that you talked about. Um, sounds, like, you know, sounds like a lot of work, but being a farmer, it does involve a lot of work, there, you know, as everyone knows. So Olivier, why do you choose to use pesticides on your farm and, and how do you use them? 
how I use them. Why? Why? Why I use them? I have to secure in my uh, productivity and, and uh, of course, my income. I uh, I only having uh, arable crops. It's very different than Eden with uh, cattle. And um, how are using uh, pesticides? I, it's very different than 20 uh, years ago, of course. Uh, now with uh, technologies, we're using pesticides only when it's needed, when, when, yes, where it's needed, and only with a little quantity. Okay. Understood. Understood. So you, you know you're talking there about the technological advances, and do you think those technological advances, you know, have mean that you can use them, that you can use pesticides in a more in a more direct way? Are you are you are you uh, using things like precision precision agriculture to kind of target uh, your crops very specifically, or are you still spraying vast swathes of your fields in chemicals? No, no. It, um, technologies uh, can uh, can help us to 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 ta uh, to, to have um, the target. Mm -hmm. I, okay. Um, I don't know. Uh, okay. That's okay. That's okay. <laughs> I, I hear what you're saying. Um, let me go back to Helen then, because you know, um, let's maybe we can talk a little bit more specifically. Do you not use any pesticides whatsoever? Because you know, what one thing which is talked about a lot in the organic versus non-organic debate is actually some of the camp, some of the pesticides may be naturally occurring pesticides, things like copper sulfate. You know, they may be sort of biological pesticides, but they nonetheless do still have an impact on 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 the environment around them. So, do you use any pesticides or, or literally none at all? None at all. We haven't used a pesticide on the farm for over 30 years now. Okay. Okay. Um, what, what about the health aspects of um, the human health aspects? Because to talk to Olivier for a moment here, I mean, you're in France, you're a French farmer, and France has really been the country where the debate about glyphosate has been the most loud, the most, you know, the most contentious um, glyphosate, this, which is obviously a weed killer, a herbicide, um, where there's a scientific debate um, we won't go into the details too much because I've only got eight minutes left here, but about whether it has the potential to cause cancer. When we were talking before the panel, Olivier, you said you use glyphosate. So are you not worried about what impact it could have on your own health? No, I'm not worried about. Um, I'm using, uh, I have uh, some, a lot of rules in France to use glyphosate. And, and I'm, I have to respect the rules I'm not. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a farmer. I'm proud, and I accept to use glyphosate when it's needed. Okay, um, Helen. I mean, you're you're the head of the, the 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 soil association. But how much? So obviously, one of the reasons why you're we can imagine that you're not using pesticides is because you you know you think that you can protect the soil by by refraining from doing so. But how much do you also think that there is a human health? rationale for not using synthetic chemical pesticides? When I started farming, I worried about pesticides much more from about the way that they allowed us to farm. Um, it was making our systems perhaps, uh, making us perhaps slightly lazy farmers and that we weren't doing the things that we needed to do to make sure that our, we were farming in rotation and that kind of thing and the biodiversity was diminishing. But I think the evidence that's come out over the years about the health impacts, and you have to look at a lot of pesticides that were allowed 10, 20, 30 years ago that have now been banned, I think we do need to really worry about the health impacts. Um, the science will always be contested. And one of the challenges is that we are testing uh, pesticides when they're launched um, on a single use basis. We're not looking at the uh, combinations of pesticides that you may be seeing on foodstuffs or in the environment. So I think those pesticide cocktails are particularly concerning because they're just not tested in any shape or form. And of course, it takes a long time for the impacts of uh, the things that we consume to come uh, through in terms of health studies. They're very difficult to do. So I do have concerns there much more than I did actually when I started farming organically 35 years ago. Okay, okay. Um, so we've, we're talk we've talked about the human health, the human health aspect. Obviously, we have to kind of rattle through uh, these, these enormous topics, um, which have, you know, which scientists have spent their entire lives um, poring over. But nonetheless, um, Olivier, let's, let's talk about the way, you know, we've already mentioned this, but how do you use pesticides? I mean, because one argument that we often hear um, is that 
it doesn't make sense for farmers to use lots and lots of pesticides because why would they want to drench their own land in, in chemicals? You, you want to be able to continue farming on your land for, for many, many years, for decades to come. So do you, is that, does that apply to you? Do you use less pesticides because it's in your, in your interest to do so? Yeah, so of course, it's, it's my interest to use less pesticides. Um, I'm a farmer. I don't want to pay for anything. <laughs> um, and and um, we have to, to, to produce more, more food uh, for, and more energy. And why, um, why can't we um, uh, use uh, organics for uh, food and um, conventional agriculture like me? for energy, for uh, biogas, biofuel, isn't it? Mm -hmm. are, you saying, are you saying that, uh, are you not producing food on your farm? Are you saying that you, that you mainly produce things for biofuels? The, the both. I'm, both, I'm, okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, w w one question I, I, I did want to ask was, um, was whether you have noticed, uh, sorry, was, was actually, um, you've heard what Helen has been saying, Olivier. Is there... Is there anything, is there any economic incentives or is there any kind of um, new policy from the government or even from Brussels which would encourage you to stop using pesticides? Or do you think that it simply is not going to be viable for you ever to do so? Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a very difficult. Uh, yeah, I think it's a, the farm to fork policy, it's a, it's a very good idea. But for me, with uh, big fields of uh, wheat, uh, barley and rap seed, um, it's, um, I, I think it will, will be very difficult. I have to, 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 to do uh, vegetables, maybe. Okay, so you might have to change exactly, you know, you might have to change what you are producing in order to, in order to fit in with that, with that strategy then. Yes, I, I maybe have to, to change and to, to, sell, uh, to sell my production to, to, um, in, in my... Uh, in my village or in the town uh, near us. Okay. Um, another thing, just because we have, you know, we're lucky to have a French farm with us, and uh, the debate in pesti about pesticides in France, I think it's fair to say, is probably, yeah, as I've as I've mentioned before, in terms of glyphosate, is is really, you know, one of the most vocal in, in the whole of Europe. So, and and there's a term which French. Um, French farmers use the FNSOA, which is the French uh, Farmers Union, uses it a lot. It's called agri bashing. So this is um, this is the the notion that farmers are disparaged, are, are looked down on in society um, because your average citizens uh, in the country consider that they're doing harm, um, and they're you know that they're. This is the idea, agribashing, that farmers are maligned um, and unfairly treated, um, and and I think when it comes to pesticides, that this you know this this topic comes up. So do you feel that, that that way, Olivier? Do you feel that there is a misperception in the public about about the work that you do and the care that you take in the field? No, oh, no. In my uh, in my country, it's very calm, but it's uh, very difficult on the social network and in the in the press. And, uh, in the yeah yes in the press and in me when I'm, when I'm talking in the town with uh, others it's very easy. Okay okay so maybe maybe this is a confected reality that, that I'm that I'm talking about but I mean nonetheless there there are protests and you know and yeah you maybe maybe you maybe this is more of a media reality than you know luck, I mean you're probably lucky to have some some nice neighbors in your town <laughs> who aren't uh, you know getting getting angry at you as well. Okay we haven't got that much time left we've got one minute left. Um, quick to quickly turn to the to the to the issue of the environment, Helen. Why don't you paint a picture of um, of, of your farm in terms of biodiversity? Do you you know, and how much can you say that not using pesticides has allowed there to be insects, pollinators, worms, all sorts of um, you know creepy crawlies and bugs and and good positive life on your farm? One of the reasons I went organic was I could see the wildlife disappearing on our farm as we became more and more uh, intensive and we're using more and more chemicals. So it was one of my big aims was to reverse that trend. And it really has happened. I and mean, the evidence shows on organic farms across the globe that you have something like 50% more biodiversity, many, many more insects. And I can see that on my own farm. It's a full of life. Um, so there's, I, I think the, the, the proof is there. Um, we can reverse 
reverse the biodiversity crash that we're seeing across the globe. It's particularly bad in the UK. Um, and uh, organic farming is a, a really good place to start. We still need to create habitats too. It's not the only thing we need to do. Um, but when, if you can get your soils right, you can get your earthworm populations back, you've got the basis of the, of the food chain for the rest of your wildlife. Um, and uh, we even now rent out photography hides so people can come and watch the wildlife and take pictures of it. Uh, lots of people coming on farm tours because they really want to see uh, wildlife thriving. Fantastic. Okay. Um, I think we'll have to leave it there if I'm, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, I think, I think we're, we're bang on time. So thank you very much to Olivier for joining us. Um, thank you, Helen, you'll be staying with us. I think that was really interesting. Obviously, it was only a very short discussion. And, and you know, I think it would be nice to be able to sit down and have hours to talk about um, you know, what, what you both get up to on your, on your farms and, and, and talk about these things more in detail. But we just can't. Um, we have to turn to our main event now, um, where our two teams of speakers will be debating the following motion pesticides are not necessary for a resilient EU food system. I'll be telling, I'll be telling you what the results of our, of our poll um, are, um, or you know, our, our interim results before the debate actually starts in a few moments. But I just want to set the scene and tell you how this debate is going to work. There are very simple rules. We will start with four minutes of opening arguments from each of our four speakers. Um, then um, you in the audience will have the opportunity to ask questions. And I've seen some questions have already been coming in, but I haven't been able to field as many of them as I, as I like so far. And I will put those questions um, to the teams. And then at the end, we'll have our closing arguments with two minutes per speaker, and we'll have a final vote. So let me introduce the teams. Um, on the proposing team, so the team which agrees with the motion that pesticides aren't necessary for the EU food system to be resilient, we have uh, Mart Martin Hoysik, um, who is a Slovak MEP from the Renew Europe group in the European Parliament. Um, he's very active on the topics of pesticides and pollinators. Also on his team, we have Helen, who we've just been hearing from, but if anyone has just joined, um, it's Helen Browning, um, who is an organic farmer and CEO of the Soil Association in the UK. And on the opposing team, so the team which, which doesn't agree, that pesticides, sorry, the, 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 the team which agrees, which thinks that pesticides are indeed necessary um, for a resilient EU food system, got a bit lost in the double negatives there. Um, we have Italian MEP Herbert Dorfman, who is the spokesperson for the EPP, the European People's Party group in the, European, in the, in the Agriculture Committee of the Parliament. And we also have um, a scientist, Lynn Field, um, who is an insect molecular biologist and head of the Department of Biointeractions and Crop Protection at Rothamsted Research in, in England. Um, so now let's look at our, at our poll. Um, the first half of the results, some are still trickling in. We've had 238 votes, which is pretty, pretty good, I'd say. Um, and I, and I, you know, yeah, the overwhelming uh, majority of 64% um, disagree with the motion. Um, only 23% agree. 13% are undecided, so maybe we can take a screenshot of that and see how it compares to the um, how it compares at the end. So, our first speaker. Well, the speakers are going to be uh, speaking in the order in which I in, in, in the order in which I introduced them for four minutes each. Um, so, Martin, it is up to you to kick us off, and there should be a timer appearing on the screen. Boom, magic. Over to you. Uh, thank you, Eddie, and uh, thank you to Politico for the opportunity to be part of this debate. I like disruption. Uh, we live in the age of disruption, so let me disrupt the motion, because I think we have to be a bit more precise in uh, what we are asking for. Because pesticides are massive variety of substances. Uh, Bacillus thuringiensis is an insecticide, and yet it's a naturally occurring uh, bacteria. So I think what we need to look at specifically is whether we need synthetic and especially synthetic hazardous pesticides for a resilient food system. And I don't think we need that. Now, what we need to start with is we need to look at how do we deal with the plant protection. And in here, I would like to take a small detail to not plant protection, but the waste hierarchy and the energy hierarchy. We have a situation where in the waste we know and we try to apply that uh, we need to first do prevention and the landfilling is the worst. In the energy, 
we know that we need to first deal with the energy efficiency and the solid for use like coal are the worst. In the plant protection, we need to take the same approach. We first need to look at the prevention. We need to take the mechanical step, biological steps, and the chemical uh, plant protection should be only the last resort. Not to mention the very, very unavoided last resort uh, should be the hazardous chemicals. Now, we see the same challenges we have in the waste hierarchy where the landfilling is trying to be replaced by the incineration. The same in the energy where the uh, gas is trying to replace coal, rather than really looking from the best solutions. Can it be done? The first question, uh, answer that I often hear to that, um, can we live without uh, synthetic hazardous pesticide is, well, there are no alternatives. Well, when we set out to do something as humans, uh, and JFK would remind you of that when he set out to get to the moon, there was no technology, we can actually achieve it. So it's about achieving the goals we set out us to. And I think if we decided this is the health of the soils, the you know uh, health of the humans, the survival of the insects are important enough, we should be able to achieve that. Second, there are already good examples. And for me, the greenhouses and the whole greenhouse ag agriculture, it's a massive example that it's been often overlooked. Because what we see is a situation where 15, 17 years ago, there was quite a bit of a public outrage that whenever you went, tested the product, you found residues of not one, but multiple pesticides uh, or different plant protection products. And the answer from the industry was, we need it, it's essential. Without it, it's not possible to do. The situation that we have now is that almost 100% of uh, the plant protection done uh, within the, uh, this type of agriculture is integrated pest management. It wasn't from one day to uh, another, but it was something that we set out to do and deliver. Last issue is we are up for disruptions. The, the lab-based meat is going to massively shift the way we do agriculture. It, I think it's we are facing the end of cheap meat from uh, factory farming. But this is going to have an implication on the amount of feed that we're growing, which is also a big uh, need, uh, user of pesticides. So this is somewhere where, again, we have to look on how we do agriculture differently, do more fruits and veg rather than staple crops. And really, I believe for the industry, it's time to aim for the green chemistry, biomimicry as the basic way forward and reaching more competitiveness also on the global market for future. Brilliant. Very well timed and very interesting arguments from Martin. Thank you very much. Um, now, we're having MEP on MEP action here. Um, we would I would like to introduce, uh, yes, Herbert Dorfman to, to argue against the motion for your five minutes. Herbert, over to you. Thank you very much, Eddie, and thank you very much for the Politico for this opportunity. Well, I asked myself uh, at the beginning, what is a resilient food system? And I think a resilient food system has three elements. There's a first element, which is a quantitative element, so enough food for everybody, not only for people who can afford it, but for everybody, because I think access to food is a fundamental right, uh, and we need to guarantee this. The second one is uh, a quality element. So um, a resilient food, uh, food system needs to be a food system where food is safe, is healthy, uh, is without negative impact on our, on our health. And the third element is maybe a, um, a resilient system combined with sustainability. Sustainability in an ecological manner but also sustainability in an economic manner. Farmers need to go have also a resilience in an economic, in economic terms. And if, I, if I look at these three points, the first one is enough. Do we, can we produce enough? And we, I think we need to be aware that uh, chemistry, fertilizers, plant protection products, for the first time in history, in Europe and in most parts of the world, guaranteed enough food for everybody. This we never had before. Um, and this we need, we need to keep in mind. And for sure, we can 
do a lot of things better, and I agree with a lot of things Martin said before. Um, but very often, if we look to the past, we tend to forget uh, the bad things that we have this glorious view of the past. We forget, for example, the great um, Irish fame where one million people died in Ireland and two million people left. So three out of 10 million uh, inhabitants of Ireland uh, all left or died because there was a new, um, a, a new uh, disease on a plant and there was not enough food. And then there's the second point is the quality point. Um, and then there we need to be aware that from chemistry, from plant protection products, there comes a danger. We need to address this danger and we need a strong legislation on it, on uh, residues, on uh, approval systems, on the use of pesticides, on integrated pest management. And I think we, in Europe to get today, we have this, uh, uh, this uh, legislation in force and we need for sure to prove this legislation and we need to, to work on, on, on uh, research and development to have uh, um, products which has less impact on the quality uh, of the food. And then there's the third and last point, this is ecological and economic resilience. And there I, I think that for sure input plant protection products are also costly. They cost something. And the more we find ways to come out for them and have use less of them, the better it is, the better it is for the health and the better it is for the economic sustainability of the farm itself. And therefore, we need to find new solutions where we need, where we can use less and produce at least the same amount or even more. But I think, and I'm convinced, if we see resilience, a resilient food system from these three perspectives, today we can do better with chemistry and we need to do better. And the farm to fork strategy is a way on this, in this direction, but we cannot do without. Fantastic. Thank you, Herbert. That was a very clear um, three-point argument. Um, so now, um, let's, not, let's not waste any time and quickly go over to Helen, um, who is on Martin's team and will be uh, proposing the motion. Thanks, Eddie. Um, well, I would uh, say that pe pesticides, along with synthetic nitrogen, actually are undermining our resilient, our resilient food system. I think pesticides are part of a package along with synthetic nitrogen and some other technologies too. Uh, they're part of a whole approach to, a f to food production, which is now being discredited. Um, if you look at what's happened, we have been over applying nitrogen onto our fields. Uh, that's led to these weak plants that require uh, crop protection products. Um, we've uh, in, got ever bigger machinery compacting our soils. We've industrialized our livestock farming, uh, leading to more antibiotic use as well. And we've turned those few crops that we grow into commodities. We've turned those into uh, monocultures and into poor quality food, which is actually making our populations ill. Uh, what we call ultra-processed food or junk food is the majority of the diet of people now in the UK, and we have a huge uh, health problem off the back of it. So pesticides and antibiotics in animal husbandry are propping up a sick system. And I think farmers have been duped and they've been co-opted by this kind of narrative that's been running around for the last few decades, uh, that this is what we have to do to feed the world. And that we're only real men, and it's often men actually, there aren't enough women uh, farming these days, if we're driving those very big tractors and we can boast about our yields in the pub uh, or in the bistro. So I would say that there are hundreds of thousands of farmers now around the world showing that there is another way, a really viable way, and that is based around the organic principles. And if you look at the work that's been done over the last few years by uh, institutes like IDRI in France, I think they show a really compelling alternative pathway to reform uh, agriculture and to make our food system far more resilient. So they did a modeling exercise which looked at the whole of Europe and said, what would, what would, what would happen if we took, went down a completely agroecological route uh, took away the synthetic pesticides and the synthetic nitrogen. 
what would happen to our food supply. And they demonstrated that we could indeed feed the projected population of Europe healthily and well using those techniques uh, in 2015, so the projected population there, that that would reduce our greenhouse gas emissions by 50%. And that's without starting to look at things like soil sequestration of carbon and planting more trees. It would reverse the biodiversity crash and it would give uh, to allow us to maintain our export capacity too. But what it would mean is that we would need to stop feeding as much of our grains to animals. So it would mean a shift in diet away from industrial livestock uh, production into ruminants that are actually helping to sustain these fertility building systems such as organic. So it's perfectly possible to do it. It needs investment. We need research going into this so that we can do it better and faster. As Martin said, if we have the will now, we can actually farm very straightforwardly without using those techniques. Um, a lot of the money that's going into research is going into chemicals. It's not going into knowledge-based solutions, which is what we need to make sure that we can get ourselves onto a good pathway. We've seen over the last uh, 40 years, uh, pesticide group after pesticide group uh, be uh, abolished from DDT to the organic chlorines, the organophosphates, the neonicotinoids, even glyphosate now. It's time to stop and get onto a new pathway. Okay, thank you very much, Helen. Um, now, Lynn, I hope you're ready. Um, I'm gonna pass the microphone over to you um, to oppose the motion you're on Herbert's team. Yes, Eddie, yes, thank you very much. It's always um, not so good going back, back to the last person, because I think inevitably there'll be some repetition. So let me start by saying that I'm certainly passionate about resilient food systems and also the need to have these alongside biodiversity and beautiful landscapes. I don't think any of us are disagreeing here, but after a career of working on crop protection, I am totally convinced that if we need to produce enough food, good quality and nutritious food, we're not gonna do that unless we can prevent the loss, the potential loss, the pests, weeds and diseases. If we don't do that, the loss of yield, after we've already invested energy, carbon footprint and resources, is going to prevent us growing enough to feed. Now, this notion is about the EU food system, and we could argue that if we're short of food in Europe, we import some. But that just shifts the onus for other people. Of course, what we really want are resilient food systems worldwide. And I believe that if we are going to protect the crops, we need to, at the moment, have some use of synthetic pesticides. I'm not saying we shouldn't be trying to phase them out, we, but at the moment, integrated pest management, as I understand it, does need good agronomic practice, as we've already heard from Helen. We need better innovation, as we've heard from Bruno, so better surveillance and monitoring, setting thresholds, making sure we don't use a pesticide when we don't need to, and we don't use a pesticide when there's resistance and it's simply not going to work. And then when we really need to bring in a pesticide, then we apply it with precision. We minimize the risk and on targets, and we use chemicals with the minimum possible toxicity to non-targets. Now, I actually believe that's possible. We're doing good research now to understand how pesticides work in detail, what the target sites are, how they're metabolized, this opens the opportunity of highly specific chemistry, which, as I've said, used carefully, can obviously help us in our quest to control these diseases and weeds and insects. We do need to be doing a lot more research. I agree entirely with what's been said. We need to develop better non-chemical methods, better trap crops, better use of plant volatiles, biopesticides, gene editing to help us, to help us make resistant plants. Those are all things we should be working on. And I'm very convinced that we are, certainly in places like Rottenstead, doing a lot of work along these lines. So I'm not actually against this motion. As it stands, I'm against it. Because at the moment, we don't have these resilient food systems. And I don't believe we can have them without some use of pesticides. I don't think actually it's a realistic option and we have to weigh up risks and benefits here. We've got to be able to feed people. People have got to be able to buy good quality nutritious food at reasonable prices 
And I don't accept the argument at the mo that at the moment we can do that. So I guess I'm really saying in summary that I think that one day I will completely support this motion. I've always thought that for many years now. In fact, I took it part in a debate like this four years ago. And I'm still hoping that one day I can do that, but I don't feel in a position to do it at the moment. I think the risks of trying to do it when, when we don't have enough good, well-researched alternatives are too high. We can't risk having huge crop yield losses in Europe or indeed anywhere, because if we can't feed the whole world, then we can't actually support sustainable agriculture in Europe. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lynn. That was really interesting. Um, wow, we've had so many different uh, arguments, different threads of the of the debate going going left, right, and centre, overlapping, countering each other. That that's really fascinating. I thought. Um, so I think my job now, in the next kind of uh, twenty minutes, half an hour that that we have is, um, you know, obviously the speakers can feel free to, to ask each other questions and to highlight different things that they've said, whether they agree or disagree. But uh, what I would like to do is, is draw out some of those um, themes that we talked about. And I think to kick off, I think one of the, one of the most obvious ones is, uh, is about whether pesticides are needed simply to help us produce enough food. And something that I think um, Helen, Helen um, touched on and, and Martin did as well is is the idea that we maybe we need to we need to be producing different kinds of food at the moment you know a huge amount of our agricultural land is is given over to producing um, feed for animals and then and those animals are then eaten you know by us so maybe we do we need to eat less meat um, we've I mean we already heard Martin say that we should be growing more fruit and vegetables so Herbert what do you what do you think about that would that be a way of using of freeing up more land which could be organic well, to be very clear, um, I very much support organic farming, which uh, needs uh, plant protection as well, because sometimes uh, plants and animals get ill and you need a solution for this. Yes, and this happens in organic farming and, and unfortunately happens in, also in conventional farming. Uh, and for sure, there are opportunities we, which we need to explore. Um, most of us maybe eat too much meat, this may be. Um, I would be very happy coming from a region where we have a very high production of, of fruits, uh, people eat more fruits. We can also improve on food waste, for example, 25 to 30 percent of the food we produce on our, on our fields uh, never go to uh, human consumption because they are simply wasted on the way. And if we uh, do not waste it, we need less. Um, but there is Till now, maybe we have, uh, there I very much agree with Flynn, maybe we will have in the future a new, new systems uh, where we can improve, but we have till today a problem of in intensity um, uh, of production in the, in, on the organic farming. Um, and there's also a big difference uh, between different crops because uh, uh, one thing is to produce wheat uh, without plant protection. Another thing, for example, is uh, produce grapes or produce apples or, or, or produce fruits without uh, plant protection. So we need also to, have to look what are we producing. Mm -hmm. Okay. Does anyone else want to come in there on the on the issue of um, you know? Yeah, Martin, go for it. Uh, thank you. Just just briefly, I want to use one concrete example, um, and that is Slovakia, my home country. Uh, you would be surprised. Uh, we are not self-sufficient in the production of fruits, vegetables. Yet we have a million tons surplus on wheat annually, and that's where. For me, this debate goes back to the common agriculture policy. How do we set it up? What, where is the support going? Uh, and very much linking to uh, intensive uh, animal farming, factory farming, to be honest, and the need for the Europe to then, in return, actually import lots of the feed from abroad. Um, and that's where I think, on one hand, we are to expect fundamental changes. On the other hand, we really need to look at more diversification and better set up for the common agriculture policy. And I agree with the fact that, no, we cannot say today 
you know, cut all the pesticides. But it's about setting on the journey and making it stick. We have the Sustainable Use Directive, but it's not being properly implemented nor enforced. And I think that's a massive problem that we face in the Europe, that we make rules which are good, but we don't follow them. Because then we would be already on the trajectory, trajectory to reduce, not stagnate or grow as we do now. Okay. Um, well, you've, you've brought us to the Common Agricultural Policy and also, yes, the Sustainable Use Directive, which is one of the main pieces of pesticides legislation that the EU has. Um, I mean, it would be remiss now not to mention the Farm to Fork strategy. We mentioned it at the beginning of the, beginning of the debate. Um, it's meant to be sort of complementing the Common Agricultural Policy. That's another debate about how they, how they will interlink. Um, but does anyone want to come in on, on, on that? Because the Farm to Fork strategy is setting this very ambitious target. It's, it's setting a target, which I think, Helen, you know, you, you might might be happy with um, of reducing 50%. I mean, obviously, you're, you're now not, no longer part of the EU, but in theory, um, uh, to be reducing pesticides and, and, and um, especially very harmful pesticides by 50%, their risks and their uses. So do we, I mean, that, that, that debate is done now. The Commission has put forward its put forward its blueprint, did that in May. But do we think this is realistic? We saw what Martin was saying with the Sustainable Use Directive. It's hard to get countries to actually properly implement that. There's been numerous reports um, showing that, you know, they've had a hard time implementing that. So is it realistic? Is this farm to fork strategy really realistic when it comes to pesticides? Does anyone want to jump in here? Can I, can I come in? Oh, Lynn. Lynn, Lynn, go for it first, and then we'll come to Helen after. Yeah, I, I mean, I think this is an admirable target, but I think the generality of trying to reduce pesticides by 50% is not what we should be doing. Pesticides are not all equal by any stretch of the imagination. Some pesticides are a lot more damaging than others. And I think, I think the risk with all policy decisions is that it doesn't look in detail enough at particular combinations of crops and pesticide and yield and, and what can and what the potential risks are to non-targets. I think we need a lot more, I would say we need more research on the scientists, but I think we need to know a lot more about the science involved in trying to reduce by 50%. And whether you can do that or whether you should just be trying to get rid of the more damaging pesticides and make sure the ones we are using are being maximized in terms of not damaging non-targets. So non-targets, you mean, yeah, non the species yeah. of animals which aren't species actually being... Species we're not you know. trying to control. For instance, in insects, you know we want to kill aphids, we don't want to kill bees. We, we need to make sure that our pesticides can live up to that expectation. And, uh, this and I believe it's doable. Okay, and yes, okay, fantastic. Um, Helen, and then I think Herbert also had his hand raised, so Helen... Over to you. Yeah, I, I mean, obviously, I think we need to move as quickly in this direction as we possibly can. So the 50% target is a great one. And I think it's thinking about what are the mechanisms that are going to allow us to do that uh, in that kind of time scale. One of the things I would suggest is that we should be looking to implement the polluter pays so that where we know we're spending lots of money, for instance, in the UK, we spend over £100 million a year trying to get pesticides out of the water supply again. We should be putting that cost onto the pesticides and onto the nitrogen so that it becomes better business for farmers to shift away from these things. We're also having a big debate in the UK about paying farmers for the public goods they deliver. And if we properly internalise the externalities of farming, uh, then I think we would end up with farmers taking a much more sensible approach to what they use and when. So if we're going to do this, let's put the measures in place, the financial pluses and minuses in place to allow this to happen quickly. OK, uh, Herbert, did you, say, did you, do you still want to come in here? Yeah. Um, but the farm to fork strategy is a strategy, and the strategy is, as Martin said, is like a journey for the next 10 years, and it needs to be ambitious for sure. Um, I think we, we need to uh, put in, in responsibility also the consumer, because what Ellen is doing on her farm is fine, but she needs a higher price for her products, because otherwise her farm would not be economically sustainable. And this we need to tell to the consumer. Uh, if the consumer, uh, if, it, if it's perfectly fine that uh, we have a higher uh, range of organic farming in Europe, but we need also a higher range of consumers which go to the shop and buy organic products. Um, 
I wonder myself, for example, why we, in the strategy, why we speak only about the amount of land which in uh, 2030 should be occupied by organic farming. Why, why are we not saying that, for example, 20% of the food uh, sold in the supermarket should be organic food? Because if 20% of the food is organic food, you can be very sure that 25% of the land is organically farmed. This is very much connected. So this responsibility which the consumer has once he goes to a shop is high, and we need to underline this. Okay, that's really interesting. And, and um, okay, Helen, Helen, you look like you want to come back on that. Then I want to yeah move it in a different direction. But you, you come I, back. I do because I think if we were to internalize the pollution and the benefits of our farming systems properly, the price differential would be much less at the store level. And we want good food to be available to everybody at affordable prices. That has to be uh, our goal. Um, you have to recognize that farmers uh, in crops get something like 9% of the value that ends up on the shelf. So farmers, the cost at the farm level is not what is often leading to high prices at the retail level. There's an awful lot going on in the chain, which could be changed to make sure that good food is affordable. And we need to do that for the health of our people. If COVID has taught us nothing else, it's that if we don't pe feed people well, that's a very poor investment uh, case going forward. So this is, this is this getting the economics of farming right is a big part of the challenge. Okay, I will just stick with you, Helen, for one moment. I I'm taking a question from our Q&A here, and there's been a flurry of questions that have come in over the last uh, few minutes, so I'm very grateful for that. Do keep them coming in. I won't be able to get to all of them, but they, but they are not interesting nonetheless. Um, so one question here, which is from an anonymous uh, person, says, do consumers understand that organic farmers also use pesticides? Obviously, we're not talking about you specifically here, Helen, but as the CEO of the, of the um, Soil Association, maybe, you, maybe you, can, you can answer this one, you know, do you think the public, if, if as Herbert says, 20% of all the food in the supermarkets did, you know, did become organic, would people actually realise that, that, that then organic food is not necessarily pesticide-free? If uh, all, of, uh, all farming went organic, you'd reduce pesticide use by 98%. Um, so there are some very small-scale uses on things, as you mentioned earlier on, on vines, occasionally on apples, uh, where there are one or two products that actually we'd like to get rid of altogether. Our aim is to get rid of them and to try and get research, enough research to make sure that we can grow those crops in ways that don't need things like copper sulfate. So our aim is, is for zero, um, but uh, going organic would reduce pesticides by 98%. Okay, I have another interesting question here, um, which is which I'll get to in a moment, but just as a sort of preamble to that, um, to try and make it look like there's, this is a smooth se segue into it. Um, we, we, we were talking about feeding you know, the global population. We were talking about feeding Europe. We were talking about why some people argue that pesticides aren't necessary to feed people at a global scale. And, and this question is asking, would withdrawing pesticides from EU farmers' toolboxes, um, which you know, no one is suggesting they would do that entirely, but the farm to fork strategy does, does uh, have a target, which we mentioned, would withdrawing pesticides from farmers not make them less competitive globally? So that's an interesting question. It's also about international trade. Um, and, and it's not only about fighting, you know, it's not, it's not necessarily about the science of, of fighting diseases, but it's more about, you know, competition and, and, and global trade. Ma I mean, Martin, would you, would you want to argue this? You talked about, you know, what Slovakia is exporting and what about expanding that to the global stage? Well, actually, I believe the exact opposite. Uh, we would be more competitive uh, for the sole reason, uh, you know, we need to not compete with the price but with the quality, I think, with the, with the expertise, with the speciality, you know, it's not something where, let's be honest right now, uh, we're not export, uh, major exporters of wheat, uh, soy, uh, the staple crops that actually use uh, loads of the pesticides. We are not able to beat Argentina or US uh, on these markets, really. It's the more special things. It's where we are more... And I think this is also a space where there is going to be more and more emphasis on uh, the quality food and on the food that was produced without uh, any uh, any synthetic chemicals and any, uh, any, any pesticides. So I'm very optimistic on this one. And, uh, you know, one of the one of the things and one of the complaints from the farmers community on the Mercosur agreement, for example, was, well, you know, we cannot compete on the price with them. So 
this is for me a question which we should ask other way around. Would it not be actually for us beneficial to look at how close to nature farming in Europe can make Europe, Europe's farming more compatible on the global stage? Okay. Um, does anyone, if, if, if no one else wants to come in here, I'll, I'll, I will turn the conversation in a slightly different direction, which no one has really talked about, but it is becoming an issue on the on the agenda. I think it was mentioned in the in the Commission's chemical strategy. There's this idea of um, it's, it's, it's the reality, in fact, that um, lots of pesticides which are banned in Europe are actually exported outside outside of Europe and sold and used in other in other parts of the world, um, usually in poorer countries. Um, so what do we, I mean, what do we, what do we, I don't have a commission official, um, you know, that's, that's uh, available here that I can grill about this, but um, the, the chemical strategy suggests that this, that this policy might, you know, might need to end of allowing companies, um, big agrochemical companies to manufacture pesticides. I think the UK is a, is a big hub for, for certain companies um, and then allowing them to be used in other parts of the world, even though they're banned here. Does anyone want to want to have a comment on that? If not, I'll just leave it hanging. It definitely Helen. be banned. It should not be allowed. We should not be exporting yeah. uh, what we are not prepared to use in, in our own countries. It's disgraceful. Okay. okay. Uh, that, was, that was a quick one. Let me go back to another thing which was interesting, um, which was raised as well, because I think there's, <clears throat> there's a little bit of a dichotomy that's being raised. I mean, we've obviously spoken to farmers, and we are still speaking to farmers at, at the moment. You know, I'm talking to Helen right now. Um, but... But there seems to be this this sort of um, this opposition between the 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 idea of the ideal farmer, you know, the the <clears throat> the classic farmer in our imaginations. Are they being duped by big agrochemical companies who you know from whom they buy these chemicals? Are they being duped and sold um, sold down the river? Use more of our pesticides, use more of our products. Often the agronomists um, who are selling them these pesticides are also the ones giving them advice on how to on how to use them. Or no, are in I fact know. farmers. So, are in fact farmers, just to finish the, the point, sorry, I'm taking a long time, actually actually innovating in amazing ways? Are they using, are they using pesticides as little as they possibly can? Lynn? No, I, I don't think farmers are being duped. Farmers aren't stupid. Farmers are businessmen, businessmen and women, and, and they want to grow crops. They, they want to grow good quality food, good quality nutritious food. And I don't believe they're being pushed. In fact, Good farmers don't want to use unnecessary pesticide. They're all very aware of the risk of resistance, if nothing else. But if they use it wrongly or use too much, they'll get resistance and it won't work. So farmers are very careful, I believe, the farmers I speak to, at looking at how much pesticide they're going to use. They want the opportunity to only use it when they really need to. They're crying out for good thresholds and good monitoring and surveillance. And, and I think they're ready and up for what we're all saying we want to do, which is reduce pesticide. But I don't think that has to equate with organic, a completely organic system. I think quality food doesn't necessarily have to be organic. It can be grown with some pesticide used properly and in the right context and within a growing system. Farmers are, are clever people, that's what I think. Okay. Um... Martin, you've got your hand up. Go for it. Um, <clears throat> of course, uh, farmers are clever, but they are not scientists, and they cannot have the detailed knowledge about pesticides. They've been told that the uh, you know, number of pesticides are fine, don't cause any problems, and I don't even have to go into the controversial uh, case of uh, glyphosate. Uh, they've been told by the chemical industry that DDT is super duper safe, no problemo, when the problems were evident. They've been told that neon neonics are no problem. Uh, and, you know, the science was already clear. So the concern is that it's not about the farmer, but it's about the advice that the farmers get. And this is where I believe that what we need really in Europe is independent from the industry, any industry, honestly, uh, farmer advice, where the farmers get to know and have to, they have a help to, for example, learn more about integrated pest management, get an independent information that they can rely on, and they can also fall back on that they, when they are advised something, they can be certain that following this advice 
will make sure that they also follow the good agricultural practice and therefore don't have a problem with non-compliance with the rules of common agricultural policy. And I think this is very, very important that we have uh, independent advice for the farmers so they're not okay. only at the mercy of those who want to sell them pesticides. Okay. Uh, Herbert, <clears throat> Herbert, go for it. I'm losing my voice, but take over from me. Well, I'm coming from a region where, fortunately, we have a lot of young farmers and skilled farmers, and they produce apples, mostly wine. Um, and I think I do not agree what Martin said, that they do not know. They know perfectly. They are highly skilled. They know what they do. What they do. I see young farmers uh, going into organic farming, <laughs> quite a lot of them. Um, taking this decision. We produce in this small region more than half of the Italian organic apples. We see, I see other young, highly skilled farmers going into a conventional farming, clearly into con with integrated pest management and trying to improve also on conventional farming. So they are completely fine with each other. The, uh, the problems are mostly outside the farmers' world. They, I think, uh, as Lynn said before, the farmers, they are, uh, we can say business, they simply try to earn some money from the job they are doing. It's, it is sometimes in politics, if I, we have a debate in the parliament, I have the impression somebody thinks farming is like a hobby. But it's not a hobby. These are families who need to earn money from the activity they do, and they take their decision. And I think we, the impo most important thing is that if we skill people. I fully agree with Martin. Uh, we need advisory systems which are independent, for sure. But we need also advisory systems which are really independent, so are not arguing for one another system, but because skilled uh, entrepreneurs takes to take decisions and they look um, at their farm and they look hard also at their pocket. And I think this is completely legitimate. Okay. Um, Helen, you wanted to come back there. Yeah, and I would agree that it's really unhelpful to set up a sort of tension between farmers around organic and pesticides and that kind of thing. Farmers are all trying to make their way in the world as best they can. But I was really aware as a young farmer when I came back here, and the farm was run conventionally then, um, that I had a queue of people trying to sell me different products. Um, and everyone was telling me that this spray would do, you know, another half a ton of yield and this fertilizer would do a bit more of this. And it was, um, it was at that point when I had queues of people outside the door trying to sell me stuff that I just said no or I want you to all go away I'm going to see a little bit like an athlete deciding how fast they can run without using the drugs I wanted to see how much food I could produce without using all those inputs and I think that there is a real need as Martin has said that to make sure that we do have independent advice that we aren't uh, buying from the people who are giving us advice and the problem is there's a real shortage of people who have got good understanding of the ecology of farming systems, of the biology, and who can give that advice in a way that farmers really need it. So at the moment, most of the advice is coming from the wrong sources, and we really need to sort that out. So I think, I, I mean, I interviewed the environment minister of, um, of one of Belgium's regions recently, of Wallonia, and who was telling me that, you know, Céline Tellier, her name is, and she was, she's trying to create an independent advisory service, which would help farmers um, with this kind of independent advice. But we've had an interesting question from, from our Q&A here, and it's also from an anonymous person. I wonder whether it's the same anonymous person asking all these questions, probably not. Um, it says, would, would someone on the panel, maybe Helen, given that you were just talking about this um, independent uh, advisory service, be able to tell us who or what would count as an independent advisor? I mean, it probably wouldn't be someone from Syngenta or Bayer or any other, you know, pesticide company in your in your ideal in your ideal world. But who, you know, is this going to be a civil servant from the government? You know, who, who is going to be this person? I, it's certainly somebody who's not also invested in selling product. It has to be independent from the sales function. I think there needs to be a certain accreditation so that you have uh, you can make sure that you're getting good advice, that they have been properly trained themselves, they understand these kind of techniques. Um, so, I, and, and I think one of the, the things that can be very powerful actually is peer-to-peer -peer advice. Farmers listen best to other farmers. So if you've got great farmers doing great things, actually to train them to give advice and allow them to earn some money from doing so, I think is a really quick way to scale up a, a, an advisory network 
um, that farmers will listen to. Mm -hmm. Okay, Herbert, you had your hand raised there. Yeah, I strongly uh, I agree with Helen, and I strongly supported the idea to invest uh, more in advisory system within our common agriculture policy. I think this is important. It can for sure be a public system. I'm uh, more convinced about uh, associations. We have a very good experience in my um, uh, region since decades of an, a free association created by the farmers themselves. They pay. They have a public support also from the common agricultural policy and uh, they organize it uh, by themselves and th th I think this is one of the best guarantee to have uh, the pure interest of somebody who wants to sell a uh, product which product ever it's not only about chemistry it's also a lot of other inputs farmers need uh, that they cannot influence uh, an advisory system okay well some some very clear agreement, you know, across the two teams there. So I think we're, we're happy, happy to see that. Um, let's talk about a specific kind of pesticides, um, which has been mentioned before. I mean, <coughs> we talked about, <coughs> excuse me, um, we talked about the different generations of pesticides that have kind of um, been banned. <coughs> excuse me, I'm losing my voice here, but I'm going to carry on regardless. Um, I want to talk about neonics, neonicotinoid pesticides. Um, and um, maybe we could bring in Lynn here. I'm not, I mean, I, I know you're an insect um, microbiologist, but I'm not sure if you've yeah. worked on these pesticides. I mean, yes. these are banned in the EU, and yet countries, we've now ha heard this week from the European Food Safety Authority that 10 countries have actually granted, fully legally, albeit, um, but they have granted these 10 emergency licenses for, for these kind of pesticides, even though they've been banned yeah. since 2018. What do, you, what do you think about that? Well, when you say they've been banned, they've been banned as seed treatments. There's still the still uses sprays. I I understand why they've had to have these derogations and allow them to be used because the, when the ban was brought in, there weren't many alternatives for a lot of farmers trying to control insect pests. The number of alternatives was very limited. So, for instance, we've seen a huge reduction in the ability to grow oilseed rape in the UK because not being able to treat the seed resulted in a lot of problems with cabbage stem flea beetle. We've also seen a lot of problems growing sugar beet because the aphid in sugar beet is resistant to everything else. The neonic is about the only thing that was controlling it. And ironically now, we're, we're actually seeing a system where people are using more of other pesticides, which are probably equally or even more toxic to bees because they can't use neonicotinoids. So I think it's a very difficult area where you're trying to balance one against the other. And for some neonicotinoids, not all, some are much more benign than others, some are much less toxic to bees. It's not a simple rule that says all neonics kill bees and, and other pollinators, you know, mustn't just get hung up on bees. So I think the ban on neonics, when it was extended to crops that, crops that flowered, I could see made a lot of sense because of the risk of residues in pollen and nectar. But extending it to crops that didn't flower, I think was done hastily. And I think it had, had, had unforeseen circumstances that made the situation worse. Okay, I think I have a sense that I mean I think uh, Helen wants to come in, but I mean I, I also have a sense that Ma Martin would want to would want to come in on this topic because I know you've been very active on it in the European Parliament. But Helen, first, why yeah, don't you? Well, Martin, you go in first. Good, Martin, okay. you go first. Martin, Martin, do you want to say, do you want to say something in response to that? Well, first of all, I would actually like to know uh, which other pesticides are being used that are equally uh, because this is hearing this from the scientist is basically uh, saying that we have a problem that we're not dealing with that is helping the to push the collapse of the uh, pollinators, which is a very worrying sign. And I think that this is something where uh, we need to sound alarm if there are additional uh, plant protection products which are uh, on the level of neonics that are still used. In terms of the in terms of the uh, continuous and exception, I think this is uh, clearly a showcase of a problem. Uh, where you know rapeseed might have been the might I, I honestly don't know the detail about the situation in uh, UK, but I can tell you the amount of rapeseed that is being planted in Central Europe is, uh, on the other hand, uh, way over the top in a massive monoculture systems. Uh, so I uh, can send some over there. But um, the the real thing for me is we are failing overall in the protection of 
bees and all the pollinators. And yes, I agree, we, have, uh, for, we are often forgetting the other the non-bee pollinators, the bumblebees, uh, solitary bees, and lots of the other insects. And this is something where it's almost disgraceful that for so many years, uh, the member states have been blocking adoption of proper rules and proper screening for uh, insecticides that would actually allow us to get rid of those hazardous ones. Because honestly, without pollinators, uh, we're not going to have any food. And this is, this is, for me, something which is a really, really big cause of concern. OK. Helen? One other perspective is that uh, we, we support um, farmer-led research. So we give small grants uh, to groups of farmers who come together to try and tackle a, a challenge. We call it innovative farmers. And one of, the, one of the really interesting things was the way the neonics ban actually led to some fascinating innovation on the ground in terms of things like companion planting, looking at techniques like grazing your oilseed rape off with sheep during the winter to reduce the foliage. Quite a lot of things that were very quickly uh, shown to be have some promise for avoiding the need for these pesticides uh, at all. So I think sometimes we're just not trying hard enough um, in terms of looking at other ways that we can avoid the problem in the first place. And I do agree with Mark, with, uh, you know, we've grown far too much wool seed rape over the years in very, very simple monoculture rotations, wheat, wheat, oil seed rape, wheat, wheat, oil seed rape. And it's not the way to farm if you want to avoid the problems in the first place. Okay. Um, we haven't got that much time remaining. I mean, I could, I could check uh, to see if there are any more. Qu How much time have we got left there? Ah, just a few minutes, a few minutes, okay. Um, there are some other questions coming in from, from our, oh, actually um, one, of our, one of our speakers before, Olivier, um, Olivier Gérard, has, uh, has just left us a comment saying that he actually, you know, um, relating to the question of um, farmers having independent advisors, he says he actually pays to have independent advi advice um, and says, you know, there are lots of rules in France, we can't use every pesticide in the world. So there we, there we go, that's Olivier's comment who we heard from earlier. Um, let me look at some other ones that we have here. Um, Slow Food Network is, is getting involved. Good to see them. I mean, one other, one other broad question that I, that, I, that I was kind of interested in is, um, is this idea of, you know, we're hearing two different visions of the future here. Um, but I'm wondering whether, just to be provocative for a moment, whether the, the people who are proposing for us to kind of go closer to nature, as Martin was saying, or to be, you know, to be using, uh, to be going towards much more organic farming, I mean, it, is that not an idyllic, kind of romantic vision of the past. I mean, we are, as, as you know, Herbert gave us this historical perspective, talking about the Irish potato famine. I think, you know, the industrial chemical industry of, of pesticides, all these huge companies that we know about today, really grew up in the, in the aftermath of the Second World War. And that's when the world's food system, Europe's food system, got hooked on these, on these substances. And there was a shortage of food. There really was a need to, to um, just to produce and produce and produce and, and, and make sure there was enough food to go around for, for the rebuilding of Europe. But, but actually, has, has that, has that pre-war period, you know, has that, has that pre-war period passed now? Um, Helen, do you, do you, what, what do you think about that? Can't, do we, should we just keep going forwards and, or, or are we really going backwards if we go back to organic? I think uh, what organic farming is trying to do is to combine the best of traditional wisdom and uh, new technologies too. So I think it's a, 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 you know, yields in organic systems now are double what they were 30 years ago. So uh, I don't think there's, it's a question of going backwards, it's about a question of combining old and new. But you have to recognise the damage that farming systems have done to our environment and actually probably to our health as well over the last 50 years. And it was completely understandable after the war uh, that we needed to get on and produce uh, more food, um, that kind of push for, for more production. Um, but... Uh, but sorry, somebody's trying to ring me. Um, but uh, that that situation is long gone. We've got plenty of food in the world, actually. The issues of poverty and uh, lack of, of food are usually political or economic. They're not to do with the fact that we haven't got enough food. There is a way forward now, uh, which is a very productive agricultural system, but one that is based much more on knowledge and good farming uh, and good sympathetic management of the environment, working with nature rather than against it. And that paradigm that we've been in for the last 40 years, a blink of time, has been a wrong road, and we can correct it fast now if we make the effort. 
Okay, Herb, I heard you, you saw your hand going up even before Helen started to speak. Um, do, do, you, do you, I can see Martin also has his hand raised. Herbert, do you want to come in on that question of the, you know, whether, whether we have taken the wrong, the wrong route and, you know, since the end of the Second World War? Yeah, I, I think evolution is never linear. Always it goes on waves. And uh, once chemistry came into our agriculture, and this was much before the Second World War, if you think to fertilizers, uh, uh, and then for sure intensively after the Second World War, we thought uh, that chemistry can solve all problems. Then we saw and we see that the chemistry uh, creates also, can create problems, there is a danger, and we need to combine the two things. We need to combine uh, knowledge from nature and um, new knowledge about chemistry. We need new products, and this is a big problem. We spoke about neonics before. The problem is also that we do not have new substances on the market, uh, and the approval uh, process of new substances, which very often are very um, uh, less uh, impacting uh, on nature, are, is very, very slow, and therefore the companies are not investing a lot on new substances. So we need to go away the way forward. And for sure, for some farmers, the way forward will, will be for, for uh, organic farmers. For others, will be a responsible use of uh, chemistry and I think a resilient uh, food system uh, to come back to our original question uh, for a continent like Europe must be a wise combination of both. Okay well we also have I think we also have some some agreement there I mean there's there's yeah um, a nuanced a nuanced answer there um, and you know it's, it's about it's about combination it's about the combining the old and the new that's what Helen said and that's what Herbert Herbert has, has has more or less said as well we are running out of time now we literally only have um, around eight minutes left so that gives us enough time firstly to look at our look at our the result of our poll um, I did take down the the the, um, the results of how it was before the the actual debate started maybe I can just get that up on the on the screen now um, so before it started, we had 63% um, of people were disagreeing with the with the motion, and around 21, 22% were agreeing with it. I'm not seeing it currently on the screen, but it's it's happening slowly. Bear with me for one for one more moment. Okay, here we go. Lots of flurry of activity is happening behind the camera. You can't you can't you can't see it. Um, Okay, nonetheless, well, I'll tell you what's about to happen. We're, we're hopefully, you know, to, to prepare the panelists, we're going to give you two minutes each um, to give some closing remarks just to summarize um, what we've had. Um, why don't we do that now? Why don't we, why don't we, why don't we start? Because I'm not seeing the, the results of the, of the poll. We'll go in the same order that we went before. And this is just really just to, you know, just to summarize, just to give us the, um, you know, give us your takeaways, what you want people to be talking about over, over the dinner table this evening when they sit, sit down in, in an hour's time to their either organic or, or non-organic uh, meals. Um, so Martin, you kicked us off in the first time round. So why don't, you, um, why don't you give us your two minutes summary starting now, please. So uh, first of all, thank you for a very interesting debate. Uh, thank you to hear that. And um, for me, the last words are simply, we need to set on a course and go the direction. I think when we heard back 15 years ago that uh, we cannot grow plants in greenhouses without intensive use of plant uh, uh, pesticides, we thought it's not possible. Today, we see it's possible. It's about setting on a journey where we really follow the plant protection hierarchy and the synthetic and hazardous pesticides are only the very last resort and not the first things that the farmer use, that the farmers have a good access to wide kit, wide array of integrated pest management approaches. It's not only about going organic. Uh, Reducing and eliminating hazardous pesticides and synthetic pesticides is really about finding the ways to do the agriculture of the future. For me, it's not about going to the past. For me, this is really about kind of breaking free from the dependency on synthetic and hazardous pesticides. I think we need it because Houston, we have a problem. We have a situation where we have deteriorating soil health, 
where we have collapsing populations of insects and we know very well that we have to do something. But there is nothing really stopping us from setting on the journey. We need to adjust the policies. We need to make the consumer choices. But we also need an industry that is willing to innovate, that is willing to go for green chemistry, biomimicry, and be the front riders for the future. Thank you very much. Perfect. Thank you very much, Martin, for your for your summary there. Um, you don't have to fill the full two, two minutes if you, if you don't want to, um, but but of course you can. Um, so Herbert Dorfman, um, would you please um, give us your your takeaway remarks? Yeah. Also from my side, thank you very much for the very very interesting uh, debate we had this evening. Mm, well, can we farm without chemistry? For sure, we can. I mean. Uh, farming is an activity which is thousands of years old, and 99.9% .9 of this time, uh, farming uh, went on without chemistry. Um, I doubt if the system was uh, resilient before, because it did not produce enough for, uh, food, because a, a lot of people uh, died uh, from hunger. But for sure, we can farm also without chemistry. I think it's a bit, and I, maybe the example is a bit, may sound a bit strange, it's a bit like medicines. Can we go out, uh, can we go on without, without uh, synthetic chemical medicines? Yes, for sure. We went on for a human, uh, humans went on for thousands of years without having all the medicines we have in the pharmacy today. Sometimes they died earlier than today. Uh, they didn't have the opportunities we have today, uh, but it is possible. There is no doubt about this. And I think we simply need to go uh, forward. We need to uh, believe in innovation, in research. We need to try to use less chemistry, less impacting uh, chemistry, for sure. We need to have more resistant plants. And I think, by the way, the common agricultural policy, which is very often criticized, which we voted uh, one month ago in the parliament, goes in this direction. We decided in parliament to spend one third of our money for a more ecologic um, uh, agriculture. This would be out of 60 billion uh, spending a year. This would be 20 billion a year. And I think this is an important and a good investment uh, for a really good future. Thank you very much, Herbert. Um, so we've now heard from one of each side of the argument. I have to admit, I think I made a slight error before when I mentioned um, that we were going to see the results of the poll. Actually, what we've done, as I did actually say at the very beginning, is we've opened the poll again. So we've reset the, reset the results to zero. Um, we've now had around 100 people who voted in the, in the second wave. Um, sorry, that's, I shouldn't be, using, shouldn't be using that term, but the second, the second poll. Um, and you know, the results are remarkably similar. Um, to what we were seeing before, but I will give you those results at the end once we've heard from our final two final two speakers. Um, so I want you know we had 300 people voting before. We've now had 100. So keep logging on to Slido using the hashtag #ResilientFoodEU and getting your votes in there. Do you agree, disagree, or are you still undecided? It's okay if you are. Um, I know I am. Um, so now let's go to our third speaker to summarize, Helen Browning, CEO of the Soil Association. Would you give us your two-minute takeaway, please? Well, I think we, we, you know, it's clear we have a real emergency now. We have, we know this is the most important decade. The decade we're in now is the one where we need to talk, turn the oil tanker around in terms of climate change and also biodiversity loss. And the system of farming that we have is right at the heart of that. Something like 30% of those impacts, certainly the greenhouse gas impacts, are coming from agriculture. And uh, most of the biodiversity loss is coming from agriculture too. So we've got an emergency around our climate, around nature and around health. And this era is the one that we need to shift from a reliance on chemistry to a real embracing of biology. Um, because biology, as we are increasingly understanding, as we understand the soil microbiome, the gut microbiome, biology is where it's at, biology and ecology. We can't wait for more disasters. We, I thought glyphosate was safe all through my farming life. I was dying to use it as an organic farmer. We now know that even chemicals we think are safe are often not. So let's try and get rid of them as quickly as possible. 
Regulators should start to look at the cocktails of, chem of, of chemicals as they are used in the field and as they're ending up in our environment because uh, the regulatory system does not do that at the moment. And we need much more investment in ecological innovation and that needs to be farmer led. Farmers need to be back in control of their farms and supported to change the way that they're doing things. It's not just pesticides, we need to look at nitrogen as well because the two are used in tandem to create this problem. And we need to move away from industrial livestock farming uh, because 80% of our nitrogen and 60% of our crops are fed to animals uh, in the UK anyway. So pesticides are making us farmers lazy actually. It's meant we've not had proper rotations, we've not not done our farming well and pesticides are making the plant lazy as well uh, because they no longer have to produce their own antioxidants because a chemical's doing it for us so it's not great for our nutrition either so it's time for a change and we can really get on with it now thank you so much helen um, and now uh, to compliment our you know the, the four speakers and to finish to finish off for us uh, lynn would you like to take the floor please Okay, well, yes, I too have enjoyed the debate. And I think what I'm hearing really is that we are very much on the same side. We all want resilient food systems and we want systems that don't use damaging chemicals that reduce biodiversity. I think we're in total agreement there. I think the difference between us is how quickly that can happen. And I don't think it can happen in the near future. I don't think we've got as far along the lines as we need to. And I think more importantly, what I don't agree with is the idea that all chemistry is bad, that we can't use chemistry at all. I think we can aim for good quality chemicals that are able to do the job we want to do without adverse effects. We can develop those, we can use them, and I think they can be part of this idyllic idea of integrated pest management where we manage crops, produce as much food as we can, produce nutritious and well-priced food so that people are not having to pay a premium and that that can include some chemistry. And I think that's the main bit where I disagree with the idea that we can't completely stop using chemistry in the EU or indeed anywhere else. Thank you. Okay, fantastic. Thank you, Lynn. Um, so um, our second poll... Um, uh, the results, I will, I will, I've, got, I've got them now. So our, mo our motion, of course, was pesticides are not necessary for a resilient EU food system. Out of the 138 people who uh, responded to that and who've been watching and, and, and wanted to, um, of course, there have been more people watching, but the ones who voted, 60% disagree, 30% um, agree, uh, and 9% <clears throat> are undecided. So we have slightly smaller proportion of people who are undecided than we did in the first round of voting. So that's probably good, um, good marks for all of you there. Um, and, you know, I, I think that's very interesting. I'm, I'm still undecided. I mean, to, uh, we don't need to, you know, reach necessarily a massive conclusion right, right now, right tonight, but we all agree this is a very key topic um, this decade. We've talked about the farm to fork strategy. We've pulled apart a little bit uh, the EU policy, what's, what's driven it, what's behind it, what would make it really practical and what would make it possible. We've talked specifically about the role of the farmer. You know, we've talked to farmers. We've talked about the role of the farmer, what inputs the farmer is getting, you know, from advisors, what inputs the farmer is putting on his fields or her fields. Um, and we think we've had a very nuanced debate. We've had, you know, we haven't just had uh, people being at loggerheads, smashing into each other. We've had people from across the teams uh, agreeing. And, um, and, I think that's, and I think that's great. Um, and so I think all that remains for me to do is, uh, is thank all our, all our four speakers for being with us this evening. Um, I've really enjoyed it. I would like to thank our partner, Bayer, as well, for making this event possible. Um, you can send your feedback on the event um, and see, see how well I've done as moderator um, at uh, events. Uh, the email address is events at politico.eu. Um, Politico, yes, I should mention that we host many events. We don't only do uh, one event per year on pesticides. We have a whole team of, of people doing events, um, virtual events at the moment, and we even have more this week. So check out our website for that. And thank you very much for joining us. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.